Assembly will hear the statement by His Excellency Rav Gonzalez, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadine. May I request protocol to escort His Excellency. I have a great honor in welcoming the Prime Minister, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadine, His Excellency Ralph, Ralph Gonzalez. I invite him to address the General Assembly. Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to add my voice to the unanimous acclaim of His Excellency Nasir Abdulaziz Al Nasser as President of the General Assembly for this our 66th session. As a skillful and seasoned diplomat, you, Mr. President, have played an integral role in establishing the state of Qatar as a central and crucial actor in international diplomacy. I have no doubt that you will approach your new responsibilities with similar dedication, even-handedness, and compassion. Mr. President, in recent months, the winds of change have encircled the globe, reaching and reshaping the unlikeliest corners of our planet for good and for ill. Those winds have swept the nation of South Sudan into these hallowed halls as a welcome and esteemed new member of our global family. They are blowing away the flimsy impediments to Palestinian statehood and breathing fresh air into stagnant negotiating processes. The winds of change have howled across the sands of the Middle East and North Africa, reshaping long-held geopolitical assumptions. The grim economic storm clouds that formed ominously on our global horizon three years ago are yet to dissipate and indeed seem to be multiplying. Natural disasters, climate change, and the accompanying non-metaphorical winds of hurricanes and tropical storms have buffeted my multi-island nation and my region yet again, upending our fragile economies and causing painful developmental setbacks. The United Nations finds itself in the eye of these increasingly turbulent geopolitical and socioeconomic storms. The role that we collectively play in response to these howling gales will determine the contours of the post-crisis world and the relevance of this institution in that world. Will the international community shield the vulnerable from these winds? Will we harness their power for positive change? Or will we become little more than unnecessary weather forecasters, watching and warning about which way the winds blew, but never acting to the benefit of our people's humanization? Mr. President, you have wisely selected, quote, the role of mediation in the settlement of disputes, unquote, as the theme of this general debate. This theme could not be more apt and timely. Too often, the difficult work of mediation, negotiation, and peaceful dispute resolution is prematurely abandoned in the search for a quick fix of militarism, brinkmanship, or ill-advised unilateral action. The very drafters of hard-fought Security Council resolutions often cast aside the letter and the spirit of these documents before their ink has dried, and the frenzied pursuit of a military solution to every dispute is sometimes sickeningly palpable. All too frequently, the loudest champions of expensive and unnecessary military action are those leaders of military powers who sometimes seek 
to shore up sagging local political fortunes with bullets, bombs, and the bodies of faceless foreigners in faraway lands. History has never been kind to such nakedly political crusades. And they who have sowed the wind have invariably reaped the whirlwind of their bloody campaigns long after the triumphalist glow has faded. Neo-colonialists and imperialist adventures, however disguised, will never triumph before the bar of history over a people's right to self-determination and the inalienable embrace of sovereignty. Mr. President, the ongoing global economic and financial crisis is a devastating storm that has shown no signs of abating. Economies the world over remain in peril, and none is immune from the widening and deepening fallout of this systemic crisis of ill-regulated financial institutions and the movement of capital. The effects of the international global and financial meltdown are now being felt well beyond the bottom lines of multinational corporations. The macroeconomic and developmental consequences of this economic tornado are now painfully apparent, as is the terrible impact on the lives of individuals. The economic crisis has spurred a rise in global unemployment, poverty, and has engendered a feeling of hopelessness, especially among the youth. The continuing fallout of the economic upheaval can be felt in the streets and cities around the world and is a major contributor to the global unrest that has pitted disgruntled youth and others in violent opposition to government forces from Tottenham to Tripoli. Social unrest elsewhere beckons in dozens of countries where neither the socioeconomic condition nor the political institutions can much longer contain the enormous pressures. Well into our third year of the econo international economic crisis, we can now declare that the tepid and timid responses of wealthy developed nations have failed to heal the global economy. The uncoordinated lurches from stimulus to austerity and back typify the confusion of the self-appointed premier fora of our international economic cooperation. The recovery that they prematurely declared was false and fleeting, and their counsel of patience and predictions of long-term recovery are of cold comfort to the suffering peoples of those countries that did not contribute to the crisis. In small, vulnerable, and highly indebted middle-income countries such as ours, the economic debacle threatens to have debilitating and ongoing consequences. We cannot afford to wait for the promise of incremental or cyclical upticks in the global economy. Small states need the fiscal and policy space to creatively spur development in ways that comply not with the checklists of discredited economic theorists, but with the real world particularities and people-centered policies international financial institutions have yet to grasp sufficiently this simple fact. The General Assembly must reassert its role in the response to the international economic crisis. In the early days of the global economic deterioration, St. Vincent and the Grenadines played a leading role in the United Nations Conference on the World Economic and Financial Crisis and its impact on development. Under your leadership, Mr. President, the Assembly must now meaningfully follow up on the unfulfilled recommendations and mechanisms spelled out in that conference. Our Caribbean region has a vested interest in this most urgent of matters. Mr. President, this year, St. Vincent and the Grenadines 
was the subject of a UN resolution that called upon the international community to provide assistance in the wake of Hurricane Thomas, which caused millions of dollars of damage in our region. While we are extremely grateful to the many countries that contributed generously to the emergency response, our national and regional recovery is far from complete. In light of your welcome call to focus on disaster prevention and response during this session, Mr. President, I remind the community of our continuing recovery efforts and the continuing vulnerability of small island developing states during this still active and ongoing 2011 Atlantic hurricane season. Mr. President, I remain baffled by the intransigence of major emitters and developed nations that refuse to shoulder the burden for arresting climate changes that are linked to the excesses of their own wasteful policies. As hurricanes Irene and Katia crept northward to typically untouched cities in the United States and the United Kingdom, we in the Caribbean felt saddened at the extensive damage and tragic loss of life, which is an annual occurrence in our region. We can only hope that our now common experiences can engender a level of solidarity and constructive engagement that will lead to binding and meaningful emissions reductions and fulfillment of commitments on adaptation financing for vulnerable small island developing states. Time is running out on the very existence of many countries in the face of rising oceans and increasingly intense storms. Mr. President, I am heartened that you have decided to place special emphasis on sustainable development and global prosperity during this session of the General Assembly. But the citizens of the world, and indeed many of the governments, have lost faith in en endless self-important summits that produce little in the way of tangible results. The archives of the United Nations are filled with grandiloquent declarations and outcome documents from summits whose commitments were forgotten even before the delegates boarded the planes to return home from their exotic locales. Next year, the issue of development returns to Latin America for the Rio Plus 20 conference in Brazil. Rio Plus 20 will take place one decade after Mexico's heralded Monterey Consensus, in which developed countries committed themselves to the target of devoting 0.7% of their gross national income as official development assistance to developing countries. Today, even accepting the liberal definitions and creative accounting used by some states to measure development assistance, developing countries are only contributing 0.32% of their gross national income as official development assistance, less than half of the monetary target. Look, we just got to get this better. We got to do it right. It's just not good for us to be taken for a ride all these years with all these promises. It has to come to an end sometime, and the world is changing. Let's get it right. It's our responsibility. Please. Our dreams in this regard, Mr. President, remain constantly unfulfilled. I'm reminded of the poetic inquiry of Langston Hughes, an authentic voice of America, who asked simply this, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a saw? and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? 
well, recent events in the streets of major cities across this world have probably answered Langston Hughes's queries. The talk is cheap. We had to get some action. Mr. President, it should be a source of alarm, an international embarrassment, that the composition of the United Nations Security Council is an ossified relic of World War II, seemingly immune to the modern realities of new countries and new global powers. It is an outrageous act of international irresponsibility that such an outmoded and increasingly legitimate body is allowed to decisively insert itself into local and regional conflicts. St. Vincent and the Grenadines is adamant that the Security Council must be reformed and that the reform be underpinned by the expansion of the Council in both permanent and non-permanent categories. With full regard to the legitimate aspirations of Africa and the necessary accommodations for small island developing states, which have valuable and creative perspectives to peace building and conflict resolution. Mr. President, the International Year for the People of African Descent, which was declared with much fanfare, is almost at an end. I am grateful to the UN, which has hosted a number of events to raise awareness of the challenges facing the people of African descent and foster discussions on potential solutions to tackle these challenges. Racial discrimination was justified and became itself the justification for a brutal, exploitative and dehumanizing system. This system, which was perfected during the transatlantic slave trade, and ingrained over the course of colonial domination. The structure for a modern world is still firmly rooted in a past of slavers and colonialist exploitation. Today, every single country of the world with a population of majority African descent is still trapped in the periphery of our global economic and development systems. The peoples of African descent remain disadvantaged individually and systematically by the entrenched and unyielding cycle of discrimination. Indeed, many of the wars that the United Nations struggles mightily to quell or avoid are rooted in the ignorant and avaricious cartography of the European colonizers. The people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines have a long and proud history of resistance to slavery, bigotry, and genocide, dating back to the heroic resistance of the Garifuna peoples against British aggression in the late 1700s. While we celebrate the noble heroism of the famous and the faceless who resisted racist colonial hegemony, we must continue to confront the legacy of this barbarism and continuing injustice. The wounds of this era are deep. The crimes against humanity are clear. And the necessity for apology and reparations are undeniable. And we cannot dock those. And when we speak this year about the peoples of African descent, we must highlight what is happening in the Horn of Africa and in Haiti. Mr. President, the collective voices of the international community are rising to a crescendo in support of full Palestinian statehood. St. Vincent and the Grenadines echoes the relevant portions of yesterday's Group of 77 ministerial statement, which welcomed the state of Palestine's application for full membership in the United Nations. The State of Palestine has brought its case to this World Assembly in keeping with the finest traditions of multilateralism. And nobody should call the Palestinian Acts a unilateral act. They come here, this is the multilateral body. And we have no doubt that its action 
and the solidarity of the international community will resuscitate the moribund negotiating process between the Palestinian and Israeli states. Mr. President, as I reflect on the sweeping geopolitical changes being wrought in our global village, I'm compelled to raise the fact that there is no practical, legal, or logical justification for the United Nations seeming indifference to the meaningful participation of Taiwan in our important work. Surely, in the context of an ever-expanding and inclusive United Nations, the 23 million citizens of Taiwan can at the very least be allowed to meaningfully participate in the specialized agencies of our organization and to extend beyond the WTO and the World Health Assembly. Mr. President, you assume the presidency amidst a cyclone of international turbulence and change. We, ne we may not be able to, to direct these winds, but we can and must adjust our sails to harness the energy and potential of this moment while riding out the storms of uncertainty and upheaval. The former U.S. President Abraham Lincoln once said in a different context, quote, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew, unquote. Our stormy present requires similar resolve, creativity, and action. Let us rise to the occasion and fulfill the immense potential of this peaceful global assembly into these swirling winds of change. Let us raise the flag of inclusiveness, equality, peace, justice, and development for all the peoples of the world to see. I thank you, and may Almighty God continue to bless us all. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadine for the statement just made.